FNSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network, and we've got John Rabino, dollarcollapse.com, on now to talk about the festivities that took place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Central Bank meeting. Fed was there, ECB, and I guess Japan as well. John, hey, welcome. Hey, Gary. So, so much ado about nothing, or much ado about something and nothing will get done, or where are we? Well, uh, the, the interesting contrast this time at, at the Jackson Hole meeting of uh, the world central banks is the, uh, the, the fact that the Fed, everybody is wondering when the Fed is going to completely stop quantitative easing and, uh, and, you know, taper completely down to zero, while everybody's wondering when the European central bank is going to start quantitative easing. And this because, because the European economy is slow and getting slower. And this is pretty predictable from the past couple of years. If you look at a um, chart of the balance sheets of the Fed versus the European Central Bank, um, you, you see that the Fed has been increasing its balance sheet. That is buying bonds from on the open market with newly created currency and in that way pumping huge amounts of new dollars into the system. The European Central Bank has been doing the opposite. They've been contracting their balance sheet, which means they've been actually taking euros off the market. So you would expect from that that the euro would get stronger and the European economy would be slower relative to the U.S. And that's exactly what happened. The euro, the euro went up. It was a strong currency for the last couple of years. And that priced European exports out of the global market to an extent and, and made life harder for the peripheral countries in Europe. And, and now you're seeing uh, Germany actually have negative growth for a while here. And it doesn't look like it's improving. You know, France is flatlining and Italy is, is flatlining. And so the, the big European European economies are extremely weak and in danger of tipping into recession. And that's horrendous for a system that's as indebted as the European Union is and the Eurozone in particular. So they can't let that happen. And, and so the only question is, what do they do about it? And it, it looks like the uh, the task is going to fall to the European Central Bank because we, we always fall back on monetary policy now. We don't have much left to do really otherwise, except just create lots of new currency, dump it into the market and see what happens. And so some way, somehow, the ECB is going to have to um, engage in something like quantitative easing. They might call it something different. They might you know, come up with some new twist, but it's going to be a process where they dump a lot of new euros into the market and hope that stimulates the uh, the eurozone economies. The U.S. meanwhile is is now debating whether the labor markets are strong enough. In other words, if enough people are working that they can really start raising interest rates and, and start tightening against all of the asset bubbles that are starting to uh, to get very extreme out there, and. Um, the consensus within the Fed seems to be that uh, the labor markets are still pretty weak and, and we need um, to get inflation up to at least 2%, maybe 2.5% in, in the year going forward. And, and so we're going to keep interest rates low even as we um, buy fewer bonds on the open market. And we'll see if they can do that. You know, it sounds kind of contradictory to me. <laughs> and, uh, and the U.S. economy is pr putting out a lot of contradictory numbers at the same time. You know, we had... Uh, um, pretty good labor market numbers for the last couple of months, but then new new home sales were just announced what a half hour ago, and they were down big. You know, in, in the Northeast, new new home sales were down forty four percent year over year, and in in the South, that's the only place where it went up, and it was only up by like eight percent. The rest of the country was down pretty hard, and that's a, a pretty good indicator of economic growth going forward because the housing market is such a big deal in in the U.S. economy, and so if um, if new home sales are contracting and existing home sales are already way down from the peak, certainly, and also down from um, a year ago. And that means the housing sector is not very strong in the U.S., even with mortgage rates. What are they now, Carrie? 4% for a 30-year yeah, mortgage? Some, four and something change. crazy yeah. low, yeah, historically. And so that that's not igniting this huge boom is pretty worrisome from the point of view of a government that needs very fast growth in order to cover its uh, always increasing debts. So you would think that Janet Yellen, who's had a reputation, I think well-deserved reputation, is pretty much a dove. You know, she likes easy money and, and, uh, and is willing to risk inflation in return for more jobs. Uh, so you've got to think that the Fed is going to go slow on the whole 
interest rate increase thing, unless they see some really, really strong numbers that surprise everybody going forward. So probably what will happen in the year ahead is that the European Central Bank will be pretty aggressive about easing. And the Fed will be not exactly aggressive, but uh, um, they'll, they'll be kind of status quo. You know, they'll, they'll try not to change anything from here. So we'll probably see the euro go down against the dollar, which is already happening. It's, it's near a, a one year low against the dollar, which is good for European exporters, bad for US exporters. So the, uh, the pressure of the currency war is gonna shift back to us. We'll be the ones with the strong currency in the year ahead. And that's just gonna exacerbate, you know, whatever slack there is in the economy. It's, if we're a l- slowing down a little bit as some of the numbers in- indicate that we are, then it'll accentuate the slowdown. It'll make us weaker than we would have been otherwise. And so I think a year from now, the pressure is going to be back on the uh, the Fed to start easing again. And, you know, this is such a zero sum game. You can't devalue your currency against your trading partners without them suffering from the, uh, the, the, the change in exchange rates and then getting back at you by devaluing their currencies. That's just how it works. And, and that's what we're seeing. It's a back and forth kind of thing. Japan does it, then the U.S. does it, and then um, Europe has to do it and, and so on. So there's no real end to this until they they figure out something else to replace this with and and uh, you know jim rickard's idea which i i like is that they'll they'll figure out that they can devalue against gold at some point and uh, all the major currencies of the world will be relinked to gold at some really high gold price like ten thousand dollars an ounce and we'll get this burst of inflation in, in the form of much higher prices because of much weaker currencies and so yeah you know the, the the dollar will be a stable currency linked to gold going forward from that point but it'll be with bread at seven dollars an ounce and gasoline at ten dollars an ounce and all the other necessities of life being extremely expensive in dollar terms so heading into that you don't want to own a bunch of dollars obviously you know and that's that's where the investment um thesis comes in the currency war investment thesis is that you you get out of the currencies that are being aggressively devalued and you get into real assets so we you know we carry you and i have I talked about this enough times that your your listeners probably know it by heart, but uh, that that is the the takeaway from all of this. You know that this is what's happening in the world, and this is what it leads to with your finances. So uh, start looking at real assets and start getting out of financial assets. You know, minimize your bank account, maximize your your gold and silver coins stashed wherever. Not to mention uh, Bitcoin, and we are starting a weekly broadcast about Bitcoin because these cryptocurrencies are going to be part of the equation here. John, I'm convinced. They definitely are. I'm yeah. so convinced of it. I mean, I hate to be like an evangelist for this stuff because, you know, there are problems with it, no doubt. But if China's like tried to kill the thing and they can't, that to me speaks volumes. The U.S. hasn't tried to kill it yet, but it will, no doubt, when when um, when it gets around to it. Right now, they don't know what to do about it. And the, the world's governments don't know what to do about it. And I'm not saying put all your money into Bitcoin by any stretch, but I just bought some. John, for the first time last week, I am now an owner of Bitcoin. I think I own about a hundred. What do I own? About one hundred forty dollars because it went up since I bought it. <laughs> so, <laughs> what price did you pay? It's like five hundred dollars. Yeah, it was four eighty something. Um, Aaron, a uh, loyal FSN listener in Abu Dhabi, he sent me five bucks worth. And then I opened a wallet with Coinbase, who I'm not necessarily that big on because they want to know who your grandmother is and, you know, her date of birth and all that to (laughs) vet you. They sent me five bucks and I bought um, a quarter of a Bitcoin for 122 bucks. And they charged me 1% at Coinbase and you can do better than that. So I'm now the proud owner of like 140 bucks worth of uh, Bitcoin. So right, yeah. well, congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the, the world of digital money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't that hard to do either. No. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And you know, I haven't bought anything yet, but people sent it to me. He sent it to me and it was like, I got a text saying or a notification. You just received it. And it's being confirmed at the blockchain, you know, and then like 15, 20 seconds later, it was like, boom, your, your transaction has been confirmed. You're the proud owner of a, a hundredth of a uh, Bitcoin. And it, nice. that's, that's all it was. And yeah. it was pretty, pretty cool. So I just uh, think that when things really, when you really have turmoil and if there's civil unrest and whatever, and you can't get to the bank and stuff gets shut down, Bitcoin might be your only uh, option out there. And, you know, 
you might want to have some. I don't know. I don't know what's going to be. And gold and silver, yeah, if it's in your fist, if you've got it, then then that's something that you got to have too. You know, you know, I'm a big proponent of uh, of hard money. Always have been since. Uh, you know, at least since 1999 and even before that, really, since the 80s, since they almost killed the system back in uh, back in the 70s with uh, when we were getting close to hyperinflation. Then during uh, Jimmy Carter's reign, I've always believed that you need to have some some hard money. And hey, let's talk about uh, what's going on with the economy up next on the Financial Survival Network. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Every day, the Financial Survival Network reaches tens of thousands of listeners and would like to reach thousands more. By adding a video channel and more show hosts, we think we can make that happen. But we need your help. If you're a regular listener of FSN and would like to help, please go to clubfsn.com to donate monthly from $1 to $100. The choice is yours, but every bit counts. There are premiums available for you, but the biggest one by far is you helping FSN get the message out to your friends and family to be prepared, hopeful, and ready. That's what FSN is all about. And that's why you listen. So go to clubfsn.com and help us get the word out before it's too late. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. So we're back with John Rubino and John. So, so what else here? What other alarming trends here in the economy that, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing the dollar over 82 on the dollar index, which got to be sending off alarm bells all over the place at the Fed. Do they really want the dollar this high? Well, yeah, that's uh, that, that's part of the whole currency war thing that uh, for, for Europe to engage in quantitative easing, you know, the real goal is to, to push down the value of the euro in uh, international markets. And that's the same thing as saying pushing the dollar up. So, yeah, this is this is a challenge for Europe. And a, a big problem for the U.S. if Europe succeeds in pushing down the euro. And again, it's it's a zero sum game. It's a game of musical chairs. It's uh, it, it's something that um, that only buys time, but that doesn't actually fix any kind of the structural things that are wrong with the economies of the world today. So um, I think that um, this, you know, obviously this can go on as long as people accept these fiat currencies. You know, they can uh, they can create a lot of new dollars and euros, send them out in the world in return for real stuff. And life goes on as long as people trust the currencies to hold their value enough to make it worth exchanging real stuff for them. And that's the big deal out there. You know, when uh, when people figure out that it's the explicit goal of their government to make their currency worth less and yet less year after year then everybody's behavior changes because they don't want to hold the currency anymore. And so um, where that begins is the question. Does it start with Japan or Europe or the U.S. or someplace else? And, and does it spread when it happens? So um, uh, that's what's out there. You know, we've got a decade of currency turmoil or um, a shorter period if this happens sooner rather than later. But it's out there. We, uh, we, we've made all the mistakes now all we're doing is trying to survive from one election cycle to the next and without any big plan in mind or anything. There's no fix out there. You know, the Keynesian idea is that, well, everything will be OK if we just get the economy growing. If people start buying stuff and borrowing money again, then things will be OK. But they're, they're wrong because we will have now taken on all the, the debt that we took on to get people to to buy and borrow, and we've got to deal with that debt. So we're, we're that much more fragile. And okay. that's what's happening. Every cycle, we borrow more money. We get things going again a little bit, but then it doesn't work because we've borrowed so much money that uh, we've got this headwind, and now we've got to borrow even more money. And, you know, we're at the point where um, this can't go on much longer. And when it blows up, it's going to be huge because we've borrowed so much money in the last 30 years trying to fix past mistakes. So at, at some point... Uh, We run out of ammunition. And the only question is when that is. And great example of it going on right this moment. And you did something with our friend Gordon T. Long about it. Subprime Nation. So this year we're going to hit new car sales almost to the level of 2007. Over 16 million new cars are going to get sold. But then you go and you look at how we did it. Auto credit. Okay. Approaching one trillion dollars, and they say, "Oh, don't worry about it." You know, defaults are down, and then the word comes out last week that 
defaults are up 70%, but don't worry about it because they're still low by historic standards. And, you know, it's just a big chimera. They're just jacking up the sales by lowering credit standards, keeping interest rates low, and just moving the metal. And yeah, the auto dealers love it. The car companies love it. But as you say, at what price? Right. Yeah. Well, the the early part of credit bubbles are always really interesting in that way because defaults are very low because everybody can get money. You know, there's no reason to default on a loan if you can just take out a new loan to pay off your old loan. (laughs) And then that that puts the the point of default three or four more years out of the future. Right. And so the banks can. Yeah. The the banks point to that and say, this is a healthy market. Defaults are actually low by historical standards. Well, what happens when when the market eventually blows up is default spike. So all those defaults that you were avoiding by, by kicking the can down the road, as you said, come all at once. And so you get one year in which defaults basically offset all the good years of low defaults mm-hmm. prior to that. And we've done this over and over again. We should know it by now. And uh, student loans was the uh, basically the bubble paper of the past few years, and now student loan defaults started to go through the roof, and they're, they're talking about some kind of uh, a government fix where they just peg your student loan payments in the future at some low percentage of your income. So if you don't make much money, you don't pay much, and in that way, you avoid defaulting. Okay, So they'll, they'll fix it in that way at the cost of much, much higher debt for much, much longer for most student loan borrowers. Now, uh, we've, we've switched um, kinds of loans to car loans. That's that's the thing that uh, that that we're going for most aggressively now. And yeah, uh, another thing Gord found when he was uh, doing his research for the the show that we did a couple of weeks ago is that um, leasing is way up as well. Yeah. And the reason for that is that a lot of people can't. Um, can't handle basic car maintenance. You know, they, they yeah. just can't come up with the money to change the oil and et cetera, et cetera. So, so they're taking out leases where they don't have to do any of that. They mm-hmm. just sign on the dotted line, drive their car away. And for uh, the next three years, the, um, the dealership handles oil changes and, and maintenance and stuff like that. And there's no chance that the transmission goes out and, and bankrupts you because the, that's covered by a warranty. And but what that's doing is is causing this huge increase of used cars when the leases run out because leases are short term, two or three years. And so the supply of two or three year old cars apparently is going through the roof, which is going to at some point on on the one hand lead people who are going to buy a new car to just buy a a three year old car for less money. And on the other hand, um, maybe crater the prices of used cars, which the dealers have taken back and are on the hook for. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so you know, if you, if you, yeah, if you take that minivan back that um, has a residual value of $18,000, but it turns out you can only sell it for 13,000 and you, you as the car company are on the hook for that. And so there's this big embedded liability in the auto market right now that nobody seems to be aware of. And that's going to blow up pretty soon. So yeah, yeah, it, it, this is really the same story over and over again. It's just a different piece of paper <laughs> that we uh, we delude ourselves into thinking uh, it, it's a great way to increase economic growth, and it, it ends up being a great way for about three years, and then uh, a horrendous way uh, for the next two years after that. So um, it, you have to think that the the auto loan side of this is nearing the end of its run because now it's up there, like you said, with in, in the same level as um, credit card debt and student loan debt uh, at around a trillion dollars. And that seems to be the, um, the point at which these things start malfunctioning. You know, that's an awful lot of debt outstanding. And by the time you've, you've lent a trillion dollars to some group of people in the country, you've used up all the halfway decent borrowers and then you're into junk credit. Yep. And that's when it blows up. Definition of a bubble in my book is once it hits a trillion dollars, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that with real estate because it's multi-trillion and different, different, uh, it's a different market, but yeah, credit yeah, cards get yeah. to a trillion autos get to a trillion student loans, get to a trillion that's bubble territory yeah, and with, with consumer <laughs> kinds of debt. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and you just see the handwriting on the wall and, and then the tip off that, you know, things are going to go bad 
is when the Fed comes out and says, nope, it's manageable. Everything will be fine. That's Yeah, they, they have to tell us what a small part of the economy it is and how well insulated it is from the rest of the <laughs> And then the that's it. Yeah. Nothing to worry about. Move along. And then that's it. You know, yeah. we're done for it. And you know what's coming down the road. And, yeah. and the, uh, reason, yeah. sorry, the reason for that is that when they feel like they have to make that statement, then, you know, they, they're dragged kicking and screaming into having to publicly make that pronouncement. That means the uh, the sector has already blown up. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's really too late and that it's it's in the process of metastasizing. And that's what they're trying to stop. But it's very hard to start stop something like that once it gets going, because um, the financial markets, especially when when they're loaded up with with junk debt, it, they're very skittish. And so it doesn't take much to to spook everybody and send them to the exits. So yep. we, we had that almost happen with junk bonds just lately. They really tanked. Oh, yeah. And there were huge outflows from the, the junk bond mutual funds. But um, a, a few weeks later, huge amounts of money started flowing back in. So that that market got a reprieve. Got to but wonder think, where that where that money came from going back there. But. Well, there's just a huge amount of liquidity out there. They're just creating so many new dollars, even with tapering and everything. There's still just a huge amount of money sloshing around out there. So um, it's very easy for it to flow from one sector to another just because there's so much. You know, it doesn't it's a a rounding error almost in in the uh, the global supply of dollars for uh, for there to be enough to uh, to move the junk bond market really doesn't take much. And so that's what happened in the last couple of weeks. But I I don't think that's the end of the story for junk bonds. They're they're uh, at a point where they're extremely fragile. And so that might be the thing that blows up, even though the last couple of weeks have been not so bad for them. Yep, exactly. And yeah, the final chapter has yet to be written for them. And the final chapter on this uh, orgy of money printing has yet to been to be written but it will be soon enough and we could write it now because the future it's obvious what's going to happen but we'll wait because uh, you know the f- the folly of it all you know you just can't you can't create wealth from a printing press it's been proven over and over and over again but you know we'll just have to go through it again because we never learn what what is the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history right it is amazing how uh, how recently the global financial system had a near-death experience. And, you know, we were a day away from martial law, according to the bankers, yeah. back in in 2008, <laughs> just 2008. Yeah. And here we are basically, it, in a lot of ways, at a more extreme level of, uh, of debt and financial speculation than we were back then. Um, mm-hmm. Big bank derivatives books are, are more extensive than they were back then. And, uh, stock prices are higher. There, there's, if anything, more money in junk bonds right now than there was back then. Yeah. And only housing is is not participating in, yep. uh, in the orgy. Everything else is uh, through the roof. So yeah, we could see a, a 2008 replay very easily, very soon. Yep, could well be the case. On that note, we got to run. Find John's work at dollarcollapse.com. Go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. See our work and make sure you sign up for the newsletter. John, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Gary. Take care. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.